Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks so much for joining me today for our webinar on the five best ways to spend your fundraising budget. This is actually our first webinar of 2021, so I'm very excited about that. My name is Linda Gerhardt, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at Mighty Cause. I've been with the company since 2000, uh, 2016, um, and before coming to work for Mighty Cause, I spent most of my career in the nonprofit sector. Um, I've worked for one of the largest nonprofits in the country, and I've also worked for very small local nonprofits. So I hope I can marry those two perspectives together here today and talk about nonprofit spending in a way that's useful and eye-opening uh, to small smaller nonprofits. Here is a look at today's agenda. Um, we're going to try our best to keep things to 30 minutes and leave some time for questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, we are recording this, so you will have access to both the recording and the slides. Um, and if you have a question while I'm presenting, just type that into the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel, and we'll make time for it at the end of the presentation. All right, I hope you guys can see my screen now. I'm so sorry about that. Um, <laughs> all right, so I apologize. GoToWebinar played a mean trick on me. So that was what you missed, my introduction slide and the title slide. So thanks for letting me know in the questions. All right, so before we dive in, um, I wanted to take a step back and talk big picture about nonprofit budgets and spending and how to decide how to use what budget you have. <clears throat> so when you're talking about spending, there are some key things you'll want to keep in mind and use to evaluate where your fundraising budget is best spent. Um, first is return on your investment. Um, will a particular tool or service pay for itself? How long will that take? Um, some tools pay for themselves pretty quickly with the money that they bring in, and some may be a longer term investment. So you'll just wanna work to understand the cost versus the potential return when making decisions about spending. Um, the second thing you'll wanna consider is efficiency, um, which hits on a couple of different things. Um, on the most basic level, um, is the tool itself efficient and how does it work how you want it to work? Um, how hard or easy is it for you to use and how long will it take to implement the tool and master it? Um, and on a higher level, does this tool or service actually make your operations more efficient? Um, there are certainly tools like the ones we'll talk about in just a minute that are very easy and simple to implement um, and easy to use, but can actually hinder your operations. Um, and finally, you'll want to think about growth. And by that, what I mean is looking to the future and considering whether a particular tool or service will continue to work for you as you grow and if it's built to support your growth. Um, is there an upper limit or threshold that you can identify where this won't work for you and you'll have to transition to something else? That's a theme we're gonna revisit a lot today. Um, so these are kind of the key things you'll wanna think of and we're gonna get into more specifics as we go on. Um, but before we do that, I want to pull back and talk about the relationship between spending and growth, um, because especially for nonprofits that have smaller budgets, um, you can sort of focus on the dollars and cents and ignore growth. Um, so when you're thinking about spending and growth, you'll want to think about a few specific things. Um, sustainability is an important thing to consider, not only the sustainability or the tool or area of, of the tool or the area of spending itself, but how well it supports building sustainable funding that will allow your organization, your programs, and your services to grow and allow you to innovate and expand. Um, and on that note, when you're thinking about spending, you'll want to consider growth. Are you investing in tools in areas that will encourage your nonprofits grow, growth and actually grow with you. Um, and finally, you'll want to think about value, um, which you may need to reframe if you're working for a smaller nonprofit that has to pinch pennies. Um, value 
does not translate to this is the cheapest I can get for this particular thing, um, but what you get in return in relation to what you spend. So a free tool you can use for fundraising, for instance, might seem the most valuable, um, but you might get more value from investing a little bit more money in a tool that costs you a bit more, but provides more control and flexibility and can support you as your nonprofit grows and changes. Um, and before we move on, there's a really great TED Talk from 2013 from a man named Dan Pelota. Um, you may have already seen this one if you've been in the game for a while. Um, and it really dives deep into the austerity mindset that a lot of nonprofits have when it comes to investing in fundraising. Um, if you're from the school of nonprofits that wants to reduce overhead at all costs and dreads questions about how much money is used on things like fundraising, this is really a fantastic watch. The whole video is about 18 minutes or so. Um, and I'm just going to show a clip of it to you that's very relevant to the things we'll be talking about today. So hopefully the audio, audio for this works okay. The third area of discrimination is the taking of risk in pursuit of new ideas for generating revenue. So Disney can make a new $200 million movie that flops and nobody calls the attorney general. But you do a little $1 million community fundraiser for the poor and it doesn't produce a 75% profit to the cause in the first 12 months and your character's called into question. So nonprofits are really reluctant to attempt any brave, daring, giant scale new fundraising endeavors for fear that if the thing fails their reputations will be dragged through the mud well you and i know when you prohibit failure you kill innovation if you kill innovation in fundraising you can't raise more revenue if you can't raise more revenue you can't grow and if you can't grow you can't possibly solve large social problems so that's just a taste of the video. Um, hopefully you got the audio audio okay, but if you're interested in watching the whole thing, the video is called The Way We Think About Charity is Dead Wrong. Um, it was something that was passed around a lot when I was working at a nonprofit in 2013, and it's just a really great way to reframe what you think about spending at, for your nonprofit, and it can also be a really great tool if you need to make a case to your board um, about expanding the budget for fundraising. Raising. All right, so the first area where it's important to invest is donation processing, which is obviously key because it's the foundation of fundraising. Um, donation processing is vitally important because it's something your donors see and use, and it's the thing that they see and use during the most critical moment as donors, which is completing a donation. Um, and if you have a clunky or inconvenient or hard to use donation processing tool, you might actually lose donors. You're actually highly likely to, specifically when they're inside that clunky tool. That's where most donors, if they leave the process, that's where they leave. Um, and obviously, this is just the foundation upon which your entire fundraising program is built. Because if donors can't make donations, you can't fundraise. And if you can't fundraise, then you're going to find it very, very hard to run your programs and offer services. So it's really kind of at the core of a good fundraising program. And an important thing to understand here is that not all donation processing is the same. So this is more complex in terms of how the payments actually work than I'm able to get into here and, or actually understand in some circumstances. But here are the two basic options available to nonprofits. Um, the first is a single use tool, um, which is a tool that processes payments and that's it. Um, PayPal is a single use tool, so is Venmo, so is Stripe. Those are tools that I've all I've seen nonprofits use in my time here at Mighty Cause, so they are used by nonprofits. Um, usually what you get is a donation button or a widget, um, or in some cases, your donors may actually need to go off of your website um, to complete the transaction. Um, these tools can be really appealing to small nonprofits, especially because they don't require a contract or a financial commitment beyond just paying fees that are associated with each transaction, and they're usually scaled to the size of the uh, transaction. So bigger transactions will uh, cost a little bit more because it's a percentage, and smaller transactions won't cost that much. So if you're a small uh, 
uh, nonprofit and the bulk of your donations are like 10, $15 donations, um, the single use tool might be appealing to you. Um, platforms like Mighty Cause, um, Classy, Network for Good, and so on are full fundraising platforms where donation processing is one of the things they offer, but uh, they also provide a suite of fundraising tools that you can use to bolster your fundraising. Um, like single-use tools, they offer buttons, buttons and widgets typically, but you'll also get things like forms, text to give, and more advanced options and flexibility for how you want to collect do donations and changing your donation processing for wherever you're collecting them. Um, and usually platforms have a recurring fee um, associated associated with a subscription, um, sometimes platform fees that took a, take a percentage of each donation to help pay for the service is pretty typical. Um, but in general, this space is moving toward a subscription model. Um, and some companies actually have a hybrid where they offer affordable subscriptions and then they supplement that with a small platform fee. So there's a lot to consider with donation processing. Um, the biggest one is data. Uh, what do you have access to and can you get what you need from those transactions that are coming in? Um, and this is a huge one, we're gonna revisit this a lot, but can donors set up recurring donations? Um, recurring donors provide a stable, productive, predictable income, and the most successful nonprofits are built on the backs of donors who give on a monthly basis. So that's really important to consider is whether a donor can set up a recurring donation. Um, and do you have control over the donation process? What are the payment options and do they meet the donor's needs? So for instance, some donors may not be able to use an American Express card with some donation processors because as a company, American Express has higher fees. Now, most donation processors just sort of uh, adjust their fee to account for that, but there are some out there that don't accept Amex. Um, can they pay with things like Apple Pay? Do they have ACH payments available for larger donations? Um, and it's also important to think about their customer support. Can you call them and ask them a question? Um, do they outsource their support? Um, and then is the tool easy to use both for your organization and for your donors? And finally, an important question I think everyone should ask when evaluating donation processors is, if my nonprofit doubled in size tomorrow, would this tool still work for me? If the answer is no, that's likely a clue that perhaps this donation processor is not something that's going to be able to grow with you and is more of a temporary solution. So obviously I'm a little bit biased here, but I highly recommend that all nonprofits, even small ones, use a platform and a fundraising suite unless there's some reason why that's completely out of reach um, for your nonprofit. They offer more than just payment processing, um, though most of them do offer more that very capably as well. So they're often the best in the market at providing donation processing, but they offer you more. Um, and they offer you different ways to collect donations from forms and widgets and buttons to more more complex solutions like text to give and campaign pages. Um, they are built to support growth um, because they're built to serve nonprofits and they're not a static tool. Um, and they're not just serving, they're not serving nonprofits and e-commerce. They do one thing very well and they have a vested interest in your ability to grow and raise more money. Um, and the more room you have for customization and making your donation process work for your organization um, than say a PayPal button, um, that's better for your nonprofit because you don't, you aren't beholden to another um, brand, another company, you're able to customize it to a process that works for you. So again, I'm biased and I work for Mighty Cause, so I think that Mighty Cause is the best. Um, and we do actually have a subscription service called Advanced that offers a lot of the things we're talking about here, like custom donation forms, text to give, branding options, priority customer support, which is a big one, and robust donation reporting. So if you're looking to upgrade your donation processor, if you've been, if you've been using a PayPal button or something like that, it may be time to give Mighty Cause Advanced a try. Um, and you do actually have access to a free trial of Mighty Cause Advanced if you're a current Mighty Cause user. Um, so the next area you want to consider investing in is donor records. 
So I've been working with nonprofits at Mighty Cause for just about five years at this point. And I've seen a lot of nonprofits that use manual donor tracking systems um, and have seen a whole lot of spread, spreadsheet situations happening. Um, and I totally understand why nonprofits end up with these systems, but they do have some issues. Um, the first thing is sustainability. Um, if you just track your donors on a big spreadsheet, that's a fantastic system if you have like 100 donors and 100 lines. But if your nonprofit gets to the point, and I sincerely hope you do, where you have hundreds and even thousands of donors and lines on that spreadsheet, it's not going to work. Your spreadsheet's going to be a mess. Um, these systems also add a lot of administrative burden. Um, having a volunteer that is maintaining a spreadsheet may be quote unquote free in terms of money you're spending on a CRM, but you pay in time and effort and frustration instead of dollars. Um, and lastly, we have disorganization, um, which is really ultimately what makes these um, systems unsustainable. Uh, manual donor tracking can be really confusing. Um, and since it's humans doing all the data entry, there's a lot of room for human error. Like I'm one of those people, I probably will make a mistake. So it's in my best interest to not be doing all of the work myself because I'm not a computer. Um, and what made sense to the person who set up your spreadsheet and your, your system or whatever you're using, it, it may be makes sense to them, but it's very hard to onboard staff or volunteers to a cumbersome manual process that worked for somebody several years ago or works for you personally when your nonprofit was just you. So again, it's totally valid when you're getting started, but over time you'll see that these manual donor records and systems don't set you up for success in the long term. The solution to a manual system is a CRM, which stands for Client Relationship Management. Um, and this is basically a centralized donor management system or database where you house all of your history and your knowledge of your supporters. Um, a CRM is built with engagement in mind, so you can create tags, segment your donors easily. Um, instead of having to parse through a spreadsheet and find donors who maybe gave last February but haven't given this February, or whatever it is you're looking to do. Um, you can track key metrics, um, you can manage your communications, and a fundamental piece of a CRM is being able to email them through the software, log your calls, set follow-ups, and, and stuff like that so that you can stay in touch with your donors. Um, so there's a lot of variability in uh, CRMs. Um, we're typically talking about something like Salesforce, but there are also big, big databases where you have um, dedicated staff who are, you know, there to manage a big donor database. So there's the smaller side, um, then there's, you know, middle of the road, which would be Salesforce, and then you have big uh, databases like a Blackwater. Uh, um, razor's edge or something along those lines or oracle um, where there's it's a little bit more intense um, and i just wanted to mention here that we do actually have a salesforce integration and our own crm tool at mighty cause so we, we can we can work with both so how do you choose a crm um, first you want to take a look at your nonprofit's needs and goals and think about what kind of support you would need from a CRM. Uh, consider your growth and what you're aiming to do in coming years. Um, and this is important because a lot of CRMs have contracts and will lock you into so many years with them. Um, and it's also a big commitment in terms of setup. Moving from one CRM to another is really messy and awful. Um, so you'll want something that you hopefully don't outgrow anytime soon. Um, and finally, the last thing to really consider is capacity. Um, as I said a minute ago, there are massive, intense donor databases that allow you to do incredible detailed things, but they might require a full-time staff who specialize in those kinds of databases. And if you're small, that's probably not going to work for you. So you might need something that's a little bit less intense that still gets the job done. And one important thing to know, as I mentioned before, especially if you're already using Mighty Cause, is that we do have a CRM that's fully integrated into our system. It's included with an advanced subscription, which is $99 per month. Um, and one thing I want to point out here is that you can actually subscribe to advanced 
on a month to month basis. So we're not going to lock you in for a year or two years or however long. Um, you can decide whether it works for you on a month to month basis. Um, and it does everything we've talked about here. Um, it centralizes your donations, your donors, and provides reporting and analytics. You can add custom tags and notes. Um, so there's a lot of things that supporters can do, especially if you're you know, stuck with a manual system and you're thinking about taking that next step to a CRM. Uh, so you can always try a free trial of advance um, or try out a subscription for a month and see if you like it if you're thinking of moving up to a CRM. And I just wanted to circle back to our Salesforce integration. Our CRM is awesome, but if you're a Salesforce user or you look at the options and you decide that Salesforce is just going to be working best for your nonprofit, we do offer an integration to our advanced customers that allows you to connect Mighty Cause to Salesforce and transfer data automatically so you're not constantly exporting and uploading lists. So you have both options at your disposal with an advanced subscription. Um, you can go to plan management on your dashboard and start your free trial. Um, and it's really up to you. We don't wanna lock you into using supporters if you would like prefer to use Salesforce. So there's options with the Mighty Cause platform. Um, and we do have this new Salesforce integration, which we unveiled last month. And piggybacking off of um, our CRM discussion, the next area where you'll want to invest is in communication tools. So when I'm talking about communication tools, the main thing I'm talking about here is email. Um, now there's a lot of other things that can fall under this umbrella, like a multi-line phone system or direct mail marketing. Those are all big investments that you'll wanna think long and hard about. Um, but for the sake of simplicity and sticking to the most common communication tools that orgs use in the digital age, I'm focusing on email marketing software. Um, and this is key because you'll need to be able to market your campaigns and communicate with your donors about upcoming events and news at your nonprofit, um, getting them involved, getting them into your facility when that's safe again, getting them to volunteer, um, and just trying to move them down the donor pipeline. Um, and the most common way that orgs accomplish this is through email marketing. So when you're considering tools, Think about what you're doing now and what you would like to do more of. There are a lot of tools. Um, Constant Contact is great for blast emails. Uh, there are programs like Autopilot that are heavier duty um, and they're great for intricate automated journeys. Um, and MailChimp is kind of somewhere in between. Um, all of them have their pros and cons. It's all about what you wanna do. There's really no right answer or tool that will work for every nonprofit. Um, the other thing to consider is the learning curve. Um, um, if you don't have someone managing all of your email marketing and your lists, you may need something that's super easy for people to learn on the fly, so you can bring in volunteers or you can sort of cross-train people to send emails. But if you do have more resources at your disposal, um, you could try to invest in something that's a bit more heavy duty, that might take some more setup um, and a little bit more time to dig into, but might do more for you in the long run if you're willing to invest in email marketing. Um, and then finally, can it grow with you? Um, something that's really frustrating, and I say this as somebody who's done email marketing for all of the companies I've worked for, is bumping your head up against a contact limit. Um, in most cases, the more contacts you have, the more you have to pay for the email marketing program. So get a feel for how many contacts you have now um, and how many you hope to get in the next few years, like how you intend to grow your list um, and explore not only the pricing, but how well the software is built to accommodate larger contact lists and a higher volume of emails. And I don't wanna to get too into the weeds with email marketing beyond just talking about the tools but if you want some more content about email marketing, you can go to mightycause.com slash guide um, and check out our webinar library. We've done a lot of great webinars on email marketing. Um, so there's a lot to dig into there if you wanna learn more about email marketing. Um, and the last thing I want to mention about email is that last month, along with our Salesforce integration, we, in, we announced an integration with MailChimp. So we can automatically feed donor info into MailChimp 
add custom fields and tags, and there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with that, like setting up email journeys for new donors. So that's available with Advanced, or you can also check out a free trial if that sounds interesting to you. Um, and another thing I'll mention is that one thing that's very frustrating when you're looking at various tools to use um, is finding choices that integrate with other programs, because there's not many uh, tools that are going to serve all of your needs. So that's one thing to look for is integrations. So uh, MailChimp uh, has an integration with us. So if you're using Mighty Cause um, and you're looking for an email marketing program, uh, MailChimp is a great choice because you can just automatically feed data back and forth. And next up is fundraising infrastructure. Um, so what does that mean? What's fundraising infrastructure? Um, but what, I, what I'm saying when I talk about fundraising infrastructure is basically the tools and systems that support your overall fundraising efforts and support the growth of your nonprofit. Um, and honestly, that kind of includes everything we've talked about today. But what I want to talk about specifically in terms of infrastructure is fundraising tools. Um, what I mean here is having a toolbox that's full of varied flexible fundraising tools that you can use to connect with your donors. So that includes peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, team and event fundraising. Um, those became very important when COVID hit and most people were moving their in-person events online, um, having campaign pages, um, and tools to engage donors, like sending thank you messages, having branded receipts, um, and things like matching grants that you can use to sort of capture donor interest. Um, and I really want to emphasize again here that recurring donations are a huge part of this because recurring donors are what will make a nonprofit sustainable. So not only the ability to just accept recurring donations, but the ability to manage them from the user end and also from your end as the nonprofit. So that's something you really want to look into when you're exploring new tools is how does this support recurring donations? Because as you grow your recurring donor base, your nonprofit's going to have more sustainable revenue. Um, and the reason this is so important is because it's really dangerous as a nonprofit to put all your eggs in one basket. You want to diversify. Um, grant funding is fantastic, but grants alone will not make your organization sustainable. Having a gala is, as the centerpiece of your fundraising calendar is wonderful too, but as we all saw in 2020, circumstances can change really, really quickly, and so you'll need to be equipped with tools that can adapt and offer you multiple streams of revenue. Um, and again, in 2020, this is really important. This was really important because all of the in-person fundraising events that orgs had to do actually became dangerous, and organizations had to go digital just to survive and pay the bills and keep their programs running. So having a lot of tools in your toolbox um, will make it easy to respond to an emergency situation like COVID, um, but also like a natural disaster or if your facility has a roof leak and you need to repair that, you can easily respond to that when you have fundraising tools at your disposal. Um, and then oftentimes you start with what tools you have when you're thinking about a fundraiser and figure out how to use them rather than starting with an idea and then finding the tools. So finding a solid fundraising infrastructure and setting that up is going to help you fundraise year round and in all kinds of situations. So that's why it's really important to invest in a solid foundation, um, solid fundraising infrastructure. So going back to commitment, um, like we were talking about with CRMs, an important thing to consider is whether a piece of software or a platform locks you into a particular way of fundraising or whether there's some flexibility. Um, just like a CRM, infrastructure is a hard thing to that's a hard thing to change when you commit to it. So also be aware of whether you're signing a contract that will lock you in for a period of time and think about how comfortable you are locking yourself to in, into any limitations that a platform or a piece of software has, um, considering how tough it can be to move. So once you have these roots in place, they're very hard to dig up and plant somewhere else. Um, can you use this one tool or do you need to supplement with other tools and does uh, that change the value for your organization? Maybe you're looking for a tool that has everything all in one and maybe you're open to you know using different tools that work for you and just trying to get them to work together. Um, does this infrastructure inspire you and seem like it'll open doors to new fundraising opportunities and new ways to engage donors. 
Um, and again, can it support you as you grow? Uh, so when we're talking about spending, it's really about investing in your organization's future. Um, so you wanna make sure you're finding a solution that not only works for you now, but will likely work um, in five years in the future when you have a larger donor base, donor base and are hopefully expanding. Um, and just a note that uh, Mighty Cause provides a great fundraising infrastructure. That was what we were designed to do, is to provide an all-in-one tool that you can use to fundraise. So uh, you can see a small list of what we provide here on the slide. This is just a sampling. Um, but if you want to go to our pricing page, we have a full rundown of everything that we provide. All right, so we are in the home stretch. I know we're just um, butting up against 30 minutes, but this is the last bit. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about is investing in fundraising staff. So I say this as somebody who worked in nonprofits for a significant amount of time. Staff is really make it or break it for most nonprofits. Um, having a skilled set of people working for your organization means that your operations will be more efficient and you'll be able to grow and meet your mission related goals as well as your financial related goals because those things go hand in hand. Um, volunteers are fantastic. I love volunteers. I am a volunteer that they cannot do what full-time staff do, or even part-time staff. Um, fundraising staff understand your mission and the ins and outs of your cause and your organization, and they're excited about your organization. They're passionate about it, and that's why they're the best messengers for your cause and why it's worth donating to your cause and caring about this cause. Um, and finally, fundraising staff are important for building relationships with donors, sponsors, and people in the community, which is what helps build your nonprofit and get it more deeply ingrained in your community. Again, volunteers are fantastic. I love volunteers, but they simply cannot do what a team or even just one skilled talented staff member can do. Um, fundraising staff, especially um, as small nonprofits, can sort of play second fiddle to program staff. Um, they're not really seen as being on the front lines or people think they're just bean counters or people who sit at a desk all day and talk on the phone, um, but they are the people who make everything at your nonprofit possible by keeping you funded. Um, so that's important to remember. Fundraising staff is super valuable and worth paying as well as you can. <clears throat> so a question I get a lot um, around this issue is, should we hire a professional fundraiser? Um, this usually comes up when a, a capital campaign is coming up or there's some other big event that they really want some help with. Um, and I wanted to actually get into the difference between staff members and professional fundraisers because there is some confusion around this topic. Um, so professional fundraisers are individuals or companies that you hire to run campaigns, consult with them, or solicit donations directly. Um, so they're consultants, essentially, and they come with the huge consultant price tag as well, not knocking consult consultants, but they do charge high rates. Um, they usually bring in a lot of fundraising experience to the table, um, and they can fill a lot of roles from helping you shape up your fundraising operations to running an actual fundraiser, and even calling donors and knocking on doors and trying to sell gala tickets or raise money. Um, these are contractors, so in some states, uh, you actually need to submit their contract to the state for approval. Um, and fundraising professionals are usually independently licensed. So in 45 states, um, you'll need to make sure that you understand the laws and that your personal fund, your professional fundraiser has all of the necessary licensure um, because you could get in trouble if you don't have that in place and you hire a professional fundraiser who, who doesn't have the proper licenses. Um, fundraising staff, of course, are individuals who are just regular employees. They're permanent staff whose tenure at your organization is indefinite, so there's no end to their contract. Um, they don't have a contract in most cases. Um, they're paid hourly or salaried, so you've got the payroll like work to do for them, and you'll also need to provide benefits and compliance with state and federal laws. Um, staff members don't need any additional fundraising licensure because they are part of your organization, so you just need to make sure that your organization organization as a whole is in compliance. 
Um, so for small nonprofits, I recommend investing in staff first um, and considering professional fundraisers if you need them down the line. Um, building a development team is going to carry you a lot further than hiring a consultant for a period of time and a specific one-off purpose. Um, and you're going to get much more from staff members in the long run. Again, nothing against professional fundraisers. They are fantastic experienced people in most cases, um, but there, and there's a reason that they, they earn what they do. Um, but when it comes to uh, developing your operations and developing your fundraising program, you wanna walk before you run. Okay, so I hope the case for staff is pretty obvious. You really do get what you pay for with employees. Um, when you offer a living competitive wage, you're going to attract better talent and have less staff turnover as people leave for better offers. Um, experienced development staff are truly, truly worth their weight in gold um, because they bring a vast sea of knowledge and experience to your nonprofit and can provide important perspectives. Um, these people will help you grow. Their literal job is engaging donors and bringing in sustainable revenue um, and again all of the good your organization does all of your programs and services need funding and fundraising staff bring that in so that you can do what your mission is to do um, and investing in skilled fundraising staff will bring in more revenue um, they usually earn their keep very quickly and then some so with all that funding you can expand your programs add new ones build new ways to help your cause and so on and so forth um, so investing in your fundraising staff is one of the most impactful things that nonprofits can do. And in many cases, you have to make a case to your board um, and some donors will keep their eye on it very heavily and see how much you're spending on staff. But investing in your fundraising staff is extremely important if you wanna grow your nonprofit. All right, so I'm a little bit over time, but I did wanna make some time for questions. So I'm just gonna check and see what's in the uh, questions box. And if you have something you wanna ask, uh, just go ahead and pop that into the questions box. Um, what is donor box considered? You know, honestly, I'm not too familiar with donor box. So uh, I'll have to take a look at them. I'll have to Google them. I'm not familiar with them. So I don't want to give you any bad information. I'm not super sure um, about donor box. Um, does Mighty Cause work with Bloomerang? Um, we do not. Bloomerang is a competitor of ours, so um, we try to integrate with as many other programs and systems as, as possible, but they do directly compete with us. So um, unfortunately, we don't offer that kind of integration with them. Oh, this is a big one. Uh, what is text to give? Um, so we actually did a whole webinar um, over the summer with um, Harbor Compliance about text to give. Um, and text to give is, it can work in two different ways. Um, the most traditional method is the one that the American Red Cross used in response to Hurricane Sandy, where you texted a, a short code or what you would think of as a keyword to uh, you know a, a specific, or you, you text a keyword to a short code, a, sm a short number, and that makes a donation to the organization and that's deducted from your phone bill. So that's the traditional way to do that. It's very expensive. You don't get your donor data, um, but typically how it works now is sort of a text to donate where you can text a, uh, a keyword to a short code or a phone number, and then the donor is, texted back a link where they can complete their donation. So it's very handy for live events. Obviously we're not doing many of those right now, uh, but they are really great if you're you know, at an event, a busy event, and people wanna complete their donation really quickly, um, they can just text that keyword in, get the link, make their donation, bing, bam, boom, they're done. So that's what text to give is. Um, there's a lot of demand for it, um, and we do actually offer text to give with advanced. Let's see. How do you transfer our current database to Mighty Cause? Um, so there's a lot to go over there. I would say uh, email support, um, support at mightycause.com, and they can sort of set you on the right path because there's a longer conversation to be had about migration, um, but we can certainly help you out with that. Just email our support staff, and they are very friendly and very knowledgeable, and they will help you uh, get the, the information you need and help start the process for you. So email support at mightycause.com. Let's see. Um, so this is a question about email templates. Um, so in terms of email templates, um, 
we are working on that actively. We don't have anything to announce just yet. And obviously we have the new integration with MailChimp. So you can integrate with your, um, your, your work on MailChimp if you're using that. Uh, but that is something that we are actively working on. We haven't upgraded it yet, but it is in the pipeline. So it's in development. Um, so just stay tuned for um, information about, about our email services because we, we are working on that. Um, how does Mighty Cause work with offline donations? We have many donors who write us checks, uh, as do many nonprofits. So uh, we do have offline donations um, available, well, not available, but you can add them to your, um, your Mighty Cause account so you can account for them you'll get a separate offline donation report um, you can log those checks and you can sort of use mighty cause as your central donation database um, so you can log checks you can also log cash donations um, you just need to enter them in um, but they can display however you want them to they can be added to your total amount raised if you're running an event or a campaign um, and we do offer a report so you know if at the end of a big team fundraiser you you want to make sure that you have a list of all of the checks that you need to find you can easily pull a report um, through your your mighty cause dashboard and get a report of all of those offline donations so we don't actually handle the money of course that you that stays with you but you can certainly log them and the donors will be added to your database if you're using supporters so you have your donations reports where you can keep them and if you're using our CRM it'll also add them to the CRM so that you can use the our CRM tool to track those donors as well. All right, is there a rule of thumb for ROI on fundraising staff? A salary of X can equal over time return in revenue of Y. Um, what are the ingredients that need to be in place uh, to set up hired staff for success? Um, so I don't know. There's pro there's a lot written out there about uh, professional fundraisers. Um, basically, you want to look at the what you're hiring them for so that can be highly variable so for instance if you're hiring a professional fundraiser to sort of help get your your fundraising housekeeping in order then that's a little bit trickier um, but the basic math would be if i'm running a capital campaign and my uh the amount that i want to raise is twenty thousand dollars and this person's um, time, they are contracted for this amount, or this is what they charge for this amount of time. How does that equal out? And do I does that make sense? So for some smaller campaigns, it doesn't make sense. So you might hire a professional fundraiser to come in and run like uh, to run your 5K for you. But if your 5K is only making $5,000 and that consultant is charging you $8,000 for their services, then obviously that doesn't add up. So it really depends on what you're bringing them in to do. Like it can make a lot of sense for a big capital campaign. Um, and it can also not make sense if you have a smaller campaign based on what they're charging. Um, so it, it really depends on what you're bringing them in to do because there's a lot that they can do and some consultants will even come in and just make sure and help you stay in compliance with laws. There's a lot of back office things that they can assist you with. They all offer different services. Um, <clears throat> so it really depends, but basically you want to look at the um, the revenue potential for whatever they are helping you with versus what they're charging um, and make sure that that is an acceptable amount to you. So I hope that helps. Um, let's see. I think that's everything. Um, so thank you for all the fantastic questions. Um, you will get access to the recording. Um, you'll get access to the slides. So uh, keep your eye out for that in your inbox. Um, and if you have any other questions for me, you can always email me at Linda at support or Linda at mightycause.com. If you have any technical questions or you need some some technical help with Mighty Cause, um, or if you if you just want to get set up on the platform, you can email support at mightycause.com and we'll help you out there. Uh, but thank you so much for joining me today and uh, have a great rest of your day.